Hello, friends. Welcome back to Five Agendas. And especially as we start this um, series on the masterpiece of deception from the thought papers published um, on this manuscript, starting with September 15th, 2020. So um, this is going to be huge, um, just like the masterpiece of divinity series. This will be exposing the Trinity. And um, so here we go, they'll be in chapters one through 12. So with each video, we'll, we'll cover one chapter. So that was just the introduction. And as always, we're not gonna be reading everything. So um, feel free to pause this and read the paragraphs that I'll be skipping over the links for the Thought paper will be in the description box below. So here we go. Well, let's open with a word of prayer for this series. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thank you for your word. Your word is truth. And I pray for our readers and viewers that the spirit of truth will guide, that these will, video helps will be a blessing, helpful, to enable all of us to give a pure, perfect testimony concerning our Father, which in art in heaven, and he who made. Sanctify us through thy truth, thy word is truth. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Okay. And it shall be, if thou do at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that ye shall surely perish. Okay. Dear reader, an appeal is made to you today to prayerfully and carefully consider this manuscript in its entirety. It is a culmination of conviction which has now by necessity been compiled in answer of the following communication from a respected and prominent individual within Adventism today who wrote, dear brother, you liken the doctrine of the Trinity to something like deviltry. I do not question what you say. I have requests from people who ask what is there in the doctrine of the Trinity that is so devilish, so spiritually lethal to genuine Christian experience. Could you articulate some reasons that would help me reply to others? Robert J. Whelan. Okay. This manuscript collates biblical and contemporary evidence in response to the question raised. We must ask just whom do we worship when we express Roman Catholicism's Trinitarian concepts for there is relevance to the warning of the third angel regarding worship. Um, may our eyes be opened so we begin to see the enemy's masterpiece of deception and understand with urgency how lethal Roman Catholicism's central doctrine is to the genuine Christian experience. We enter the domain of the, of the Yahweh's and thereby we are utterly helpless and dependent upon the grace of God for when, for where we tread, we are on holy ground. Whenever an attempt is taken to explain the doctrine of God, we all truly need a live coal to touch our lips, that the calves of our stammering lips can convey a small portion of the revelation of the gospel. The title of this subject is not child's play. We are dealing with a very sophisticated enemy to deceive, just as John who fell at his feet is dead, we too must similarly prayerfully bow when we approach the great I am, the first and the last, in awe of our wonderful God and Savior, who alone provides light and knowledge and complete salvation. Written back in 2006. Chapter 1, The Capstone, The Mystery of Iniquity. So here we have this logo. And some of you may be familiar with that. And so 
all the footnotes for everything will be at the bottom of each page here. The New King's James Version logo, but called the triquitera, from a Latin word meaning three covered, cornered, is an ancient symbol for the Trinity. It comprises three interwoven arcs, distinct yet equal and inseparable, symbolizing that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are three distinct yet equal persons and indivisibly one God. This ancient symbol is used by pagans and Wiccas. Okay, and there's the links. Uh, and then see also symbols of the church. And I don't. Edgar Allan Poe wrote that the best place to hide something is where everyone can see it. Right there. The symbol above is an example of something hidden where everyone can see it. The symbol known as triquitra is the recognized identity of Roman Catholicism's Trinitarian Godhead and found within the covering pages of the New King James Bible. The complexity of the Trinity and its ultimate and its multitude, sorry, of Trinitarianisms is expansive, subtle, and at times seamless, yet extremely lethal. What makes it so devilish is that the issue about whom we perceive to be God, it is for this reason that what one can perceive to be true can be just so close to truth and yet not truth at all. Therefore, truth about God and worship of God is the foundational basis for the genuine Christian experience. I mean, you know, you can have um, statements of belief regarding baptism or um, tithe or, but when it comes to number one, it's the Godhead. And this is what we're dealing with. So the definition of the Trinity as provided in the footnote is the capstone of the mystery of iniquity. The ecumenical bride of Revelation chapter 17 in her synthesis of God, the Niceno Constantinople Creed declares, for there is only one God and insists the faith of all Christians rests on the Trinity. It may be Catholics and some professed Christians, but this does not include those that follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. And moreover, ex cathedra, she asserts the mystery of the Most Holy Trinity is the central mystery of Christian faith and life. And here's some footnotes from the encyclopedia. Catholic Encyclopedia. See here? The Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and yet they are not three gods, but one God. In this trinity of persons, the Son is begotten of the Father by an eternal generation, and the Holy Spirit proceeds by an eternal procession from the Father and the Son. That's not what John 1, 1 says. See, within Christianity, the doctrine of the Trinity states that God is a single being who exists simultaneously and eternally as a communion of three persons, Father, the source of eternal majesty, the Son, the eternal Logos, a word incarnate as Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. See? Uh, one God and three persons, all of whom as distinct and co-eternal persons or hypostases share a single divine essence, being or nature. Uh, you know, this statement for its utter accomplishment is the mind of unrighteousness, the mind of the dragon, because as we will see, it is the capstone and worship of a false god. It is the mystery of iniquity. So simply put, remember in Isaiah 14, 
Satan said, I will be like the Most High. He wanted to be worshipped. He created this trinity, trinity, one God thing. And what it means is, those that believe that, in preaching and teaching this, all the credit goes to him, all the worship. Okay? And it's barely a false God. And mine is the dragon, because as we will see, it is the capstone and mystery of a false god. See? Interestingly, the monotheistic Trinitarian belief finds itself as article number one of constitution accepted by all member churches of the World Council of Churches. See, there's number seven. There's your link. So much in common. Okay? Um, Documents of interest in the conversation between the World Council of Churches and the Seventh Amos Church. James White often described this teaching as the old Trinitarian absurdity and wrote down here. The greatest fault we can find in the Reformation is the reformers stopped reforming. Had they gone on and onward till they had left the last vestige of papacy behind, such as natural immortality, sprinkling, the Trinity, the church would now be free from her unscriptural errors. The Ministerial Association General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists replicate the Niceno thrust of one God and unashamedly express Roman Catholicism's view of God. This monotheistic emphasis does not contradict, they say, the Christian concept of the triune God or Trinity. Triune meaning one. There is no distance between the persons of the triune God. And that's taken from Seventh Amos Belief. It was 10. Yeah. Roman Catholicism counsels catechumens. The divine unity is triune. Now, this is the Catholic faith. We worship one God in the Trinity and the Trinity in unity. There are not three gods, but one God. This common emphasis to the dogma of the Trinity as especially monotheism's one's God as being the Christian concept and that it does not contradict a triune God or Trinity is pure confusion. The implicit worship of one God when there is more than one identity, John 1.1, 1, 1, At the baptism of Christ, the Father spoke, the Holy Spirit came down in the form like a dove, and the Word was in the water being baptized. Sister White does not convey the triune monotheistic concept of Rome by the expression, the heavenly trio, three, but rather a tritheistic view of God. Because what this means is, John 1.1 1, 1 is saying, there were two in beginning. First angel's message to worship the two in Arche in beginning. And from Bethlehem, Philippians 2, okay? The evidence is that he emptied himself of the form of God. Okay? He sends forth his Holy Spirit to be another comforter. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you by the Holy Spirit. Continuing on, the Holy, um, the Niceno Constantinople Creed commences. I believe in one God. The confession of God's oneness is inseparable from the profession of God's existence and equally fundamental. God is unique. There is only one God. In reality, there is only one um, Satan who wanted to be worshipped, who is being worshipped through these creeds, these confessions. It's clearly breaking the first commandment, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 
because this is worshiping the enemy of unrighteousness. So this uh, St. Gregory of Nazianus says the infinite co-naturality of three infinities. But the first angel's message of Revelation chapter 14 is instructive. Our Savior is also worthy of worship. So there cannot be just one God. And the Bible says there's two. In beginning. Trinitarian monotheism creates the seamless worship of one who selfishly wanted to interpose and exalt his throne and be like the Most High, he of whom the true witness warns. All the world wondered after the beast, and they, all the world, worshipped the dragon? How else can all the world really worship the beast? and worship the dragon, except through the Trinity, this one God thing. And many know it not. The monotheistic notion that there's literally one God is a denial of John 1.1. 1, 1. Oneness and plurality does not constitute one identity. The Yahweh's are of one will, character, knowing, desiring, deciding, and act in unison for the purpose of salvation of mankind. So we will see shortly how this creed removes the very top rung from the ladder of salvation. Jesus alerted the beloved in the end days. Remember, deception would be so spiritually lethal that, if possible, would deceive the very elect. From Matthew 24, 24. In other words, the track of truth lies close beside the track of error, and both tracks may seem to be one to minds which are not worked by the Holy Spirit, and which therefore are not quick to discern the difference between good and error, between truth and error. The quote you will recognize concerns the book, The Living Temple, which was the alpha of deadly heresies. The Lord's messenger continued, the Omega will follow and will be received by those who are not willing to heed the warning God has given. So the alpha of deadly heresies concerned the Godhead. The Omega would be no different. The issue of alpha was about and over God. The Omega is the capstone of the Alpha. For example, our Lord affirms, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me, and the glory which thou gavest me I have given them, that they may be one, and when that happens, that doesn't turn us into one literal physical identity. But we worship, we pray, we, we work together as one, that they may be one, even as now, even as we are one. And so this oneness, you know, harks back to Adam and Eve, two people, but Akkad, oneness and duality. I and them and thou and me, just like the Shema. Here is the Lord our God's plural is a cod, oneness and duality. That they may be perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. <laughs> that we all might be of one spirit is the unity desired for God's remnant people, revealing unity and truth. The same will, character, knowing, desiring, deciding, and they acting in unison, working out our own salvation as the Elohim desired for us all, Christ in you, the hope of glory. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is spirit, and they that worship him must worship him 
in spirit and in truth. So that's the chapter one. Chapter two will be on the ladder and we'll get to that. Okay, so I just checked to make sure. Um, so in the link below, you'll find the um, link for the thought paper here for September 15th, 2020. Masterpiece of Deception, chapters one and two. And the links um, you can access here in this online edition for future, uh, further study and research. One thing I want to draw your attention to is, where is it? John 1.1 1, 1 from the Greek, which reads as en arche, en ho logos, kai ho logos, en pros ton theon, kai theos, en ho logos, which means at no point can John 1.1 1, 1 be interpreted um, that there's only one God or three, or that there was a father, son, literal, begotten, born, birthed, brought forth, emanated, generated, or whatever in eternity. That's beyond our comprehension. It specifically, nothing more, nothing less, reveals two in beginning, that the Logos was with the Theos, and that the Logos was, was God, was Theos. So hopefully this helps. Um, so this is chapter one. Stay tuned for chapter two. God bless.